So, here's my hope. My hope is that you have just read uh, from the book of Job, and you're getting acquainted with some of the really wonderful aspects of this book. So, um, let me start by saying that this week we're looking at what you might call the gifting model of communication. And gift is something that makes us feel very uncomfortable. A lot of us, when we receive a gift, like there's a part of us that's like, wow, that's really cool. But there's another part of us that doesn't know how to respond. It can be uncomfortable to get a gift, right? And in many ways, communication also puts us in an uncomfortable place. It puts us in a place where, oh, I don't know how to respond to this exactly. I, I, it, it requires a certain kind of you might say, reflectiveness and engagement that can be uncomfortable, um, which is, I think, by the way, why Job likes to see himself as a philanthropist at the beginning of the book, as the powerful giver to other people, as the provider for his children, and, um, and so forth. Um, and so at the end of the book, after he has repented, we see him uh, becoming the recipient of the gift, which puts him in a humble and in a in a, I guess you, I guess you could say a, 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 a good kind of uncomfortable position. The models of communication that we've looked at so far are often driven by a vision that is almost spiritual in its impulse. Whether we're talking about the semiotic model or whether we're talking about the dialogic model or the disseminational model, um, these models are often driven by this yearning to have connection with another person. And the, the crazy thing about it is that these models are often driven by a, 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 a desire to have this connection with the other person in a way that doesn't require any work. But Ngoye, you know that communication almost always requires work. It requires a lot of work. It's a labor, right? Um, and, and so, um, communication is not free of friction and effort, but the book of Job importantly reminds us that it is, um, something that involves grace. It is something that involves gift. It is something that, yes, it, it, it requires a great deal of effort from us, but it also, um, gives us access to what you might call gift. Um, in the book of Job, we find a, a piece of literature. Um, I don't know if Job is a historical person. I don't know if this story actually happened. Um, it looks very much as if it is a constructed story. Somebody is telling a tale in a way that will persuade the audience to behave and believe in certain ways. Um, Christians believe that the book of Job is the word of God. So God is somehow addressing uh, God's people and the world through this book. And so because God does this indirectly and doesn't say exactly what God is trying to do in the book, we have to read it with a, a kind of um, uh, playfulness and joy and also a kind of humility and slowness and reflectiveness. I have misread the book of Job a lot in my life. And um, I have heard bad sermons based on the book of Job as well. But God addresses us, I believe, in this book um, and through other books like the book of Job. Um, and God uses uh, speech, scripture is speech, um, and he, he does this in a way that changes us. And it, it doesn't leave us alone. It alters us. Um, I think that's what I'd like to say about the introduction or the, the, what, what is going on theologically in, in the book of Job. Now, I'd like to share with you, um, a little bit of what you might call an establishing shot. You know, at the beginning of a TV show or a, a scene in a movie, 
the camera will often sort of pan back and we'll show you the building where the action is going to be taking place. Or we'll show you the lawn or, or the, um, the, the shoreline where all the drama is going to be happening. I'm going to do a little bit of that now, but I'm going to do it through an imaginative um, recounting. Um, and, and I want you to, you've now read some of the book of Job, I want you to listen or imagine or envision this um, establishing shot. They are sitting on the ground when you arrive again, these four men. They have bits of ash still clinging to their bald heads. One of them is covered in lesions, which he is scraping at with what looks like a piece of clay pot. Behind them is the burned out shell of a house, and three of the men are wearing black. The fourth seems to be wearing very little at all, maybe just a blanket. You know, because you have stood there several times over the past few weeks, that the men in black have been trying to persuade the fourth man to stop hiding something. They're sure that he's hiding something. They have spoken in measured tones, using language that is balanced. It's composed of maxims or wise sayings. It often comes in twos. Their reasonableness has behind it some of the deepest traditions of wisdom in their tribe, their tribes. The man draped only in a blanket, he seems to be the owner of what is left of the house behind them, the burned out house. But he has spoken along a range from sharp sarcasm to dull-eyed despair to tender yearning. He even at one point breaks into a hymn about where wisdom can be found. You know, because like so many people in your village, you have stood listening to the arguments of these four men, and to that fourth man in particular, you know that he insists he has nothing to hide. That in fact, everything has been taken from him. He was once the richest man in the region. He had seven children, an enormous farm with various kinds of livestock, doesn't look like it now, but he was the sort of leader whose life seemed to increase in dignity every single day. The most veteran, the oldest of the citizens would defer to him, and the youngest would put their hands over their mouth when he passed by, and this respect was well deserved. He was a philanthropist. He was unfailingly generous to any who had suffered loss. He was also a law and order man. He was not somebody you wanted to cross in court. But now he sits mute, as do the others. All four men seem to have come to the end of their speech. They have exhausted their attentiveness for each other. It's not a good silence. It's an exhausted silence, broken only by the sound of pottery scraping on the pock-marked skin of the fourth man. You are Elihu, the fourth of Job's friends. You meet him, if you're reading in the book of Job, you meet him quite late. And in this dank silence comes an occasion for you to speak. You have deferred to the others, to Eliphaz, to Bildad, to Zophar, because you are younger than they are, and because you were certain that they, with all their maxims, with all their wise sayings, with all their experience about what's right and what's wrong in the human condition, you were certain that they could talk their way to resolution with Job. But the wisdom inherited from the fathers and mothers of generations back has simply failed in this case. 
You've also deferred to Job partly out of habit, partly out of a sense that he would eventually find his way to truth. But that doesn't seem to have happened. Instead, all four of the men have said much the same thing over and over and over again until they seem to have spent the air. Their muteness feels to you not just like, wow, everybody has stopped talking. It feels to you like an emptying out of speech, like a, a void opened up in language itself. You feel the press of what should be said or what might be said or what's available to say, and you feel it in you. You feel it rising in you. It's like, it's like guilt that needs to be confessed. It's like wine that is ready to burst from its bottle. What are you going to say? So that was my establishing shot from the book of Job. It is a story that is over 2,000 years old, and it was sung to the Hebrew people after they had been routed from their homes and made exiles in a strange land. If you know the Old Testament, you know that the people of Israel, uh, were they made a covenant with God, God made a covenant with them, and if they kept that covenant, he would be their God. Um, but then, if they didn't keep the covenant, he was going to send them into captivity, and that's exactly what happened. They didn't keep covenant with God, they didn't stay loyal to God, and so he sent them into uh, captivity. And... Um, after they came out of that, they didn't feel like much of a people. They didn't feel powerful anymore. They didn't feel like they had any wealth. They felt like they'd lost everything. And so the book of Job comes to them, and it seems to somehow speak their condition. There were prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel, and those prophets uh, told them that their exile was a punishment for wrongdoing. And this was a pretty plausible thing to say, frankly. Um, but there were also sages, teachers of wisdom, and they approached the captivity in a very different way. Um, they didn't just utter wise sayings and, you know, fierce prophecies, but they told stories, like the book of Job. And they asked questions, like you find in the book of Job. Questions like, where are you, God, right now? This book was probably written quite late in Israel's history, um, and it may have been written after um, the Hebrew people had encountered Greek culture, as we did in reading Plato. Um, I don't know if they would have read, whoever wrote the book of Job, I don't know if he would have read Plato. That's an interesting thought. But he probably had encountered Greek culture. And... Um, what you encounter when you in read Greek thought and philosophy is a, a kind of skepticism. There's a willingness to ask questions, uh, just like Socrates does. Um, and it's very interrogative, and it's even like an interrogation. Um, so um, what we find in the book of Job is a lot of question asking, and it is um, not necessarily providing a lot of answers, um, but it is confronting us with um, the character of um, a God who reveals himself through stories like this. I think that's all um, for my exposition, uh, my establishing shot, and my explanation of the sort of larger book of Job.